Hello, fellow lovers of discourse. I am sitting at my desk with a very noticeably uncleaned room behind me and am very obviously reading from my script on the screen in front of me because I want to match the levels of care and attention to detail of our subject matter today. If you've clicked on this video, you've probably heard of the book we're going to be talking about, as well as the author of that book, Abigail Schreier. She's been interviewed by a confederate sea of dunces, ranging from Candace Owens to Tucker Carlson, and the front of the book enjoys the endorsements of Dennis Prager, Michael Knowles, Ray Blanchard, Michael Bailey, and Ben Shapiro. Uh, but don't worry, I've been assured by very smart and honest influencers online that despite receiving endorsements and promotions solely from transphobic bigots and being titled Irreversible Damage, the Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters, that this book is not transphobic in the least. Let's stop with the preamble and find out, shall we? The author's note begins as the book means to continue, with a blatant fucking lie. Transgender adults are a different matter. I refer to them by the names and pronouns they prefer wherever I can do so without causing confusion. I'll be getting some use out of this screenshot as we trudge forward. The introduction is titled, The Contagion, and any hope you may have had for a nuanced and honest discussion well, honestly, it should have been gone by the time you read the title and the endorsements it got, but if there was any benefit of the doubt left, it should be gone by now. This is a book written from start to finish as blatant fear-mongering. It starts with an anecdote talking to the mother of a trans boy, where the mother's word is taking over that of her adult, college-aged child, and in which a trans identity is likened to a drug, a baptism, and a rebirth in the span of two sentences. Trier just can't wait to poison the well, so she's already mixing her metaphors. Uh, then she makes it clear that this book isn't about trans adults, who simultaneously describe a lifetime of struggling with their identity, but also never needed a mentor or to be celebrated and just want to be left alone. It's very clear that to Schreier, that's what the good ones do. They don't need activists fighting for their rights or support from other people and would not have benefited from information about gender identity at any point during their childhood or adolescence. Because she thinks more kids identifying as trans is akin to the fucking Salem witch trials of the 17th century and that we've replaced demonic possession with gender dysphoria. This next part is one I want you to keep in mind as we explore the entire thesis and supporting materials of her book. She goes straight from talking about exorcisms and top surgery to how much she loves the First Amendment. And she loves the First Amendment because it lets her misrepresent laws in order to fearmonger to idiot conservatives, which is indeed about as American as it gets. She represents the California and New York laws that simply brought gender identity under the umbrella of health and safety codes and non-discrimination protections respectively as compelled speech, as so many others have done before her, despite having four years worth of debunking. She's chosen to use the introduction of her book about how dangerous information is being spread online to your children and how, if this is a social contagion, society perhaps can arrest it, to talk about the importance of free speech. We then head into chapter one, and after preemptively framing the trans kids as being manipulated by a viral contagion and their parents as being decent, loving, hardworking, and kind, subject to abuse from society for merely wanting what's best for their daughters, you can see where this is going. To understand how some of the brightest, most capable young women of this era could fall victim to a transgender craze, we should begin by noting that adolescent girls today are in a lot of pain, he writes. Then, in a roller coaster of moon logic, she talks about how kids today are suffering mental health disorders more often because they're too coddled and haven't been toughened enough by the risks of experimentation, that they haven't been sexually active enough, that the transgender craze is a form of rebellion that's replaced smoking and drinking. It's all because of those damn iPhones and spending too much time on the internet reading lies. Oh shit, is that a note to save this section for future reference later? The rest of this chapter is a lot of personal anecdotes, which I don't much like talking about. I do want to point out that these stories are not told by the girls themselves, but rather by their parents. And of course, nothing the parents say is ever questioned or even framed in anything resembling a negative light. I'll be referring to these kids by the names given in the book, because that's all I have, and by neutral they-them pronouns, because it's that fucking easy, Abigail. The first kid, Julie, has two moms, and Schreier really wants you to know that because that means they couldn't possibly be bigoted against trans people, right? After Julie starts questioning their gender identity, the moms take them to a therapist who made the mistake of raising the possibility of gender dysphoria and referring Julie to an endocrinologist, which they shut down without a second thought. It was the first and last meeting, put it that way. Then they go to another therapist that uses Julie's preferred name and pronouns. So. Two therapists in, and they still resist the idea of listening to their kid until, finally, they try using the name and pronouns Julie wants. 
But when that doesn't instantly improve their relationship, they ditched that within a week and started getting concerned about the indoctrination Julie must be experiencing at school and online. One night at dinner, one of the moms, who, again, can't be bigoted against trans people because she's a lesbian, says that biology, not hyperfeminized stereotypes, is what makes someone a woman. Somehow, Julie's mental health began to deteriorate. I wonder if parental support is somehow linked to the mental health of trans kids. Oh, wait, yes, obviously, of course it is. Julie abruptly cut off contact with their mothers, who discovered, to their horror, that the person they had to snoop on Julie's Instagram account found that they were really happy after top surgery and that they were getting love and support. How awful. Predictably, then Shroud goes into how tomboys and lesbians don't exist anymore and everybody's transitioning instead. Her sources for this are anecdotes from a single 16-year-old and Julia D. Robertson, a lesbian writer fond of Grand Linham and founder of the turf site The Velvet Chronicle, who boasts about being the first writer brave enough to publicly compare transitioning before the age of 25 to gay eugenics. Thoroughly researched, says Ray Blanchard. And this sets up another blatant contradiction Schreier will use throughout the book. To her, there's all the difference in the world between being gay and being trans. The former is fine and natural and capable of truly expressing who someone is. And the latter is a lie your daughters are being tricked into believing that will result in irreversible damage. And yet, Schreier will repeatedly use someone's acceptance of the former as a shield against accusations of bigotry for the latter. The next kid, Sally, was raised by liberals who, Schreier, again, wants you to know, supported gay marriage long before it was legal and loved their tomboy daughter. That is, until Sally went off to an expensive Ivy League college, a place where newly legal adults go to have their minds broadened and their preconceived notions challenged. And then Sally's parents were flabbergasted when that, you know, uh, that, that exact thing happened. Sally left their Facebook page open one day and their mom thought it was okay to read their private messages. And so a weird theme of parents snooping on their adult children's social media, where they have not been given consent to invade, has been established by two out of two sets of parents so far. Speaking of themes, when Sally finally does come out to their parents as trans, these decent, loving, and kind parents instantly shut that down, saying that they don't think Sally can ever become a guy, that they should tone down the unusual appearance if they ever want to get a job, despite not doing that and still getting the job, and then at least heavily implied that by paying for Sally's way through college, they, as parents, should get a say in what Sally does with their body as an adult. Next is a short section about how our quick fix era is tricking kids into turning trans to avoid the discomfort of puberty. I'm let that one hang out by itself for a second. Then we get to Gayatri, another kid with fairly progressive immigrant parents from India who still never gave in to their new kid's new name or pronouns and were horrified to learn that they were happy with their new identity. I can't help skipping around a little bit here. Uh, the end of the book features a where are they now style afterward about the kids talked about in this chapter. And Gayatri's parents concluded that their experiment with acculturation had been a mistake. So they moved across the country to re-immerse their kid in traditional Indian culture and threw out their binder when they did it. This is framed as a success story. Schreier ends the chapter with an anecdote about how a friend she grew up with gave terrible sex advice based on dubious personal experience, but that was still better than the dangerous gurus deep within the caverns of the internet that await us in chapter 3. Chapter 2 is a love letter to Lisa Littman and her study on so-called rapid onset gender dysphoria. Uh, I've done an entire video on that study already if you want an in-depth look at it, but I'll go over Schreier's framing of it here. I love that she starts out by saying that Dr. Littman knew almost nothing about gender dysphoria in 2016, and yet decided to conduct a study on it a short time later. And I shit you not, directly after the chapter in which Schreier says that the internet is corrupting our children, she doesn't seem to take any issue whatsoever with Littman being inspired by posts she saw on social media. Her results astonished her, Schreier writes. Schreier doesn't mention where the 256 parent reports came from where she writes this. She hints at something being off about the source of these parents when she describes the woke mob that accused Littman of deliberately soliciting anti-trans parent groups, again, using their supposed support of LGBT rights as an umbrella term as a shield against any possible bigotry. This and another criticism comparing the recruitment for Littman's study to recruiting from clan sites to demonstrate that blacks really were an inferior race are summarily dismissed as yet more woke nonsense, describing those recruited parents as simply having been asked questions about their own children. 
Finally, nine pages into the chapter, Schreier lets it slip that Littman had discovered websites where parents were describing cases similar to the ones in the previous chapter and proceeds to compare gender dysphoria to an eating disorder. She doesn't mention these sites here, which are Fourth Wave Now, Transgender Trend, and Youth Trans Critical Professionals for some reason, probably because it would then been completely obvious that yes, of course, these are biased sources. And yes, of course, if you pull from websites dedicated to saying a thing, they will indeed say the thing when you ask them in a study. Oh, she brings up one of the sites later, and I cannot wait to tell you how. She says more about the study and the fallout afterward, but again, nothing I haven't already covered in more detail more than a year ago, so there's your next video if you haven't seen it. She makes this claim that, at best, doctors' treatments are ineffective, and at worst, doctors are administering needless hormonal treatments and irreversible surgeries on patients likely to regret them, which is a claim in desperate need of a citation that you'll be surprised to find out that Schreier does not give, opting instead for the ever-popular but she triggered the libs justification for why it must be right anyway. To be fair, she does have a chapter on the shrinks where she touches on the ample amount of research that runs contrary to everything in her book. So I won't call this a lie just yet. Uh, here's a picture and a link to a meta-analysis proving that statement wrong anyway, though. Just, just put up there. The rest of the chapter is spent telling the reader how cool and nice and friendly and definitely not bigoted Lisa Littman is. To show how wrong the people who tarred Lisa Littman as a bigot and a bully really were, Trier points out that Littman spent several years working for Planned Parenthood and wrote several pieces for HuffPost about how bad the GOP approach to healthcare was, none of which mentioned, let alone defended, trans people. Because Schreier is in no way writing this as an effort to give a fair shake to all sides or even to inform you on the topic. She's here to fearmonger. And ironically, she doesn't want you to question her narrative. When describing a letter to Psychology Today published to rebuke Littman's study, Schreier has to reduce every claim they make to an absurdly reductive and easily refutable phrase that is then immediately followed by a longer dismissal of those claims in parentheses. A letter signed by more than 40 qualified professionals detailing many of the methodological flaws in the study Schreier valorizes is reduced to six words. When interviewing Littman, Schreier is positively giddy with wild speculations as to what the study might mean, offering societal maladies from the popularity of Pride events to Caitlin, in quotation marks, Jenner, eyeing the camera hungrily for Vanity Fair, to inflated, co co inflated collegiate sexual assault statistics. Oh no. Schreier devotes another paragraph to yet more reckless speculation, not even worth debunking, which at least she seems aware of, even if it never amounts to any kind of self-reflection. Schreier, like just about everyone else who took this study as gospel and then ran with it to attack trans kids, either didn't read the study, doesn't know how to read studies, or is willing to lie about what they say and mean to push their narrative. Let's talk about how the study came about for a second. Remember those websites from earlier? The ones that Schreier never reveals as the source for Littman's subjects in her survey? Those sites were Fourth Wave Now, Transgender Trend, and Youth Trans Critical Professionals. The first two were the primary inspiration for Littman's search. These are websites explicitly geared towards denying the validity of both gender identity and the effectiveness of transitioning, especially for kids, for parents to meet and swap their stories. In a book in which Schreier's sole argument is that kids are being radicalized into a transgender craze by the internet, the origin of her primary source is one in which parents were whipped into a bigoted frenzy by internet forums. Not only that, but if a survey participant didn't specifically say that their kid was exhibiting these symptoms Schreier is presenting as a widespread contagion born from kids adopting minority identity to become happy, they were excluded from that study. Imagine if you wanted to find out how common redheads were in society. So you found a study that excluded anyone who didn't have red hair and then wrote a book that got national attention to argue that red hair is an epidemic. If that wasn't enough, it should be if you have two brain cells to rub together, but we can no longer give Schreier the benefit of the doubt. If that wasn't enough, this is not a prevalent study and does not attempt to evaluate the degree to which this presentation of socially mediated onset of gender dysphoria is widespread in the population. That's from Littman's study. Schreier's primary source, almost word for word, debunks the title and premise of her book. Two chapters in, and as far as I'm concerned, it's just for fun from now on. Chapter 3, The Influencers, has already been covered in an excellent video by one of the unfortunate targets of Schreier, Ty Turner. To reiterate some of his points, Schreier did not reach out to most of the influencers she puts in for the sole purpose of highlighting how dangerous they are to kids, and when she's not outright lying about what they say in their videos, she's put in an incredibly creepy amount of emphasis on their physical appearances. 
she makes a lot of like weird and just unnecessary comments about our bodies. These are real people that she's talking about. A lot of the videos that she's chosen are either of younger trans people or like videos we posted when we were younger. Um, so like the ones she's talking about me, I'm 17 and I got uncomfortable reading what she had to say because she's like making comments about my lips and stuff. It's just, it's just weird. <laughs> I don't know where you have to be in your life to be a grown ass woman writing a book to be published <laughs> where you feel the need to talk about the way a 17 year old kid's lips look while also simultaneously calling him like a weird child predator or something i don't fucking it's it's beyond it's out of reality come to think of it she spent a good paragraph or two describing lisa Littman's appearance too uh, but it's hard to chalk that up to a stylistic choice when she's taking extra effort to specifically pick apart these people in a way seemingly designed to assure her readers that don't worry you can totally still tell Anyway, go watch that if you want to for a first-hand account from one of her targets, but I still have some things to say about this chapter because it's one of the most egregious examples of how willing Schreier is to distort the truth in order to scare parents as much as possible. She divides this chapter into various themes from trans gurus and uses extremely limited and select quotes from videos to make her point. Under the first theme, if you think you might be trans, you are, Here's how she represents a video from Ashley Wilde. Having doubts while you question your gender is 100% normal. One might think that they'd advise exercising caution about transitioning, given the capriciousness of one's gender feelings, but the reverse is true. Okay, before we go watch that video, what do you think the reverse of recommending caution would be? The video is going to tell kids to rush into transitioning with reckless abandon, right? My last piece of advice, wait it out. Doubts are gonna come up. It's not always gonna be easy. Sometimes you'll have two options or three or 10 or 50 and you won't feel strongly about any of them and that doubt will start to creep in. But the thing is, gender and identity, just like everything else we learn about ourselves, becomes more clear as we experience life. You can't know how you will behave in a situation that you've never been in. You can't know what will be comfortable for you if you've never tried it. So just wait it out. Oh, Schreier's a fucking liar, would you look at that? Immediately below that, she writes that Chase Ross, one of the good ones in this book that she actually bothered to interview, briefly changed his mind when he was younger and stopped taking testosterone after a year on it. She's framing it as if he was having doubts and actually still thought of himself as a woman. But speaking of doubt, let's watch that video. All right, so one of the biggest, biggest reasons why I'm going off tea is because I didn't ever want to be on tea for more than a year. Oh, look, he didn't change his mind at all. He never planned to take tea for more than a year and was happy with the results. Schreier the liar, a catchphrase just lazy enough to be appropriate for this book. Here's a source about the dangers of chest binding. And immediately after giving that source, she lists fractured or bruised ribs, punctured or collapsed lungs, shortness of breath, back pain, and deformation of breast tissue as side effects. Do you think those come from that source? You know goddamn well they don't. The study found reduced lung volume in 20 trans men while wearing chest binders, but could not say anything about the long-term effects due to the small sample size and short time frame of the study. Now, that's important. It's, it's good to know the risks of anything, and there should be nothing at all wrong with pointing out the potential risks of the overuse of compression garments. But that would be honest and reasonable. And Schreier is here to fearmonger. So she writes punctured or collapsed lungs after that because she knows most parents aren't going to go check. Another quote from another video, why not? Jet Taylor has a message. True love is unconditional love, love without restrictions. For you not to accept someone as they truly are is you not truly loving them. Parents of suddenly trans-identifying teens, beware, he's talking about you. If you question your daughter's sudden insistence that she is transgender, you do not really love your daughter. What's more, you are imminently replaceable. Those who are meant to stay in your life, those who love you unconditionally, are always going to stay, that Taylor tells his audience. Let's look at the context again. I'm sure it'll be different this time. Another thing that was said to my friend that resonated with me, or that I had heard before, was those who truly love you do not accept this, meaning your transition. Those who truly, truly, in all caps, underlined bold, those who truly love you do not accept this. True love is unconditional love, love without restrictions. For you not to accept someone as they truly are is you not truly loving them. That's not you loving them unconditionally. That's loving somebody with a condition. If a parent tells you that 
the people that support you don't truly love you, that's, that's not true. And I really want you to remember that when you're afraid to come out to anybody. Because those who are meant to stay in your life, those who will always love you unconditionally, are always going to stay. Those who truly love you don't accept this. Parents like this are painted as victims over and over in Schreier's book. And to respond with, people who love you unconditionally won't leave you, is framed as yet another threat against parents to further victimize them. True love isn't about emotional support and open communication. It's about paying tuition, you see. This is a vibe I get from the book as a whole, too. Like, parents lament about how much they spend on their kid as if they think they've bought the rights for them not to have a trans kid. So admittedly, I've been quite a bit angrier in this video compared to most of my other ones, even my debates. And it's in large part due to this next passage. So content warning for suicide up ahead. Skip to the time code on screen to avoid it. Schreier brings up Leela Alcorn, a 17-year-old trans girl who committed suicide after her parents forced her into Christian conversion therapy and the alarmingly high suicide rates among trans people. A ton of studies show that an accepting environment and the freedom to transition goes a long way towards alleviating the mental anguish trans people often experience, but rather than acknowledging the harm brought about by rhetoric from both Schreier and the parents she props up in her book, this section is entirely devoted to how kids use suicide as a manipulative lie to trick people into helping them. Not only that, she takes the opportunity to intentionally misgender Leela seven fucking times in two sentences. This is ghoulish. Trier and anyone who defends this book ought to be ashamed of themselves. But the projection is real because the next section is about how trans influencers take a by any means necessary approach to deceive parents and doctors and will gladly lie in order to get what they want. To demonstrate this, she uses a quote from Lippmann's study that came from Reddit as an example of the online advice trans kids are likely to get. That post has eight comments, and six of them are saying to tell the truth, with the other two being from a random Redditor with 46 karma. This is a nobody, someone with eight posts to their name and with absolutely no influence in trans or, as far as anyone knows, any other circles. But Schreier saw this quote in Lippmann's study and thought, yeah, that's probably what all these trans influencers are saying, good enough. Okay, but what about that second quote? It's also from the Littman study, from the exact same section, which means it's also from Reddit. At no point does Schreier ever tell you where these quotes came from. She simply describes them as trans advisors on social media. So congratulations, if you have a Reddit account and have ever made a post on a topic, you are now an advisor on that topic, according to Abigail Schreier. The references she gives don't link to these threads. They link to Littman study, so... Did Schreier just rip them from that section without checking where they came from, or did she purposefully leave out the part where they came from tiny Reddit posts to let her audience fill in the gaps with the much larger named influencers she spends the rest of the chapter talking about? Well, she says it again towards the end of the chapter, summing up the trans influencers she's talked about, and it's very clear that she's talking about people like Ty Turner and the other YouTubers and instagram -ers and writes that they tell you to lie to doctors while referencing the exact same figure with the Reddit quotes from the Littman study, so, you know, the second one, she's lying. And that's it. Those are the only two quotes she uses in this section about how trans influencers typically take a by any means necessary approach to procuring cross-sex hormones. She finishes by bringing up a story about how a kid's dad found their binder and cut it up in front of them. No added commentary, and that's that. Well researched, they said. This chapter in particular has gotten some well-deserved criticism for just how needlessly cruel and targeted it is. Where it's real people, you can look up either by searching for their names or clicking the links to their videos she gives. She includes the sentence, her pronouns are they, them, when describing someone in their late 20s. So, you know, an adult. Great author's note, Abigail. She says they don't pass, that they rarely seem to have anything going on in their lives besides being transgender, and that they crave attention from their audience of fickle teenagers to avoid their next mental health crisis. Then it ends. Next chapter. The schools! Trier's main gripe in this chapter is that schools are doing things without the parents' permission, including the horror of allowing children to seek confidential medical treatment without parental notification. Schreier, a lawyer, shrugs off a California Teachers Association decision to bring hormonal treatments for trans kids in line with existing state and federal confidentiality and consent laws to pretend that 12-year-olds are now able to walk out of the door during school hours to get cross-sex hormones. Something that does not happen. Still, that doesn't stop her from gleefully rolling down her slippery slope argument to say that soon kids will be able to get a cocktail of testosterone pumped into them right in the nurse's office. The rest of this chapter is Schreier, who promoted this book as an important bulwark in the war on free speech, incredulously gesturing at dangerous ideas being taught to your children. In doing so, she casts a wide net, and despite using support for gay rights as a defense elsewhere, 
Schreier really doesn't think that we should be teaching LGBTQ education in schools. All of her friends are bisexual, cries one parent, concerned that her child really liked pride celebrations and once spent an entire day in seventh grade wearing a rainbow flag. It's not just the T's, you sees, it's also the L's, G's, and B's, a propaganda C that started with glee. I'll, I'll stop now. In an absolutely hilarious mess of a paragraph, Schreier laments that schools would dare mention that the astronaut Sally Ride was a lesbian because it takes away from the far more important and child-appropriate fact that she was a woman. Kids should only hear about good identities, you see, and with absolutely no proof whatsoever, she says that not only are we forcing this stuff down kids' throats, but they're rewriting famous women in history to not be women anymore. You know, for all you whine about us teaching this stuff to kindergartners, Schreier, it seems like that's about the level that it needs to be taught to you because you seem to have no grasp whatsoever of the distinction between sex and gender, let alone anything more complex. Everything pro-LGB, and especially T, taught in schools is propaganda and indoctrination. If that sounds like I'm mischaracterizing Schreier's arguments, here's a quote. There is no reason to teach students that the expression of transgender identity or any other form of gender expansive behavior is a healthy, appropriate, and typical aspect of human development. That's indoctrination to Schreier. And it's all done under the guise of anti-bullying, this terrible indoctrination. She's aware, states outright, that LGBTQ students and trans students in particular are a vulnerable population and that they are targeted by much higher rates of violence than their fellow pupils. But instead of causing even a nanosecond of cognitive dissonance in her book about how everyone's following the new fad, she says that anti-bullying education has an ulterior aim. That, that, that being, you know, uh, indoctrination. Trier has the proper solution to deal with bullying, though, don't you worry. You can't write an entire book attacking something without presenting a viable alternative. Uh, so parents and educators, listen closely because schreier has got you covered. Tell kids to be nice. Remember how in the 60s, during the civil rights movement, they just told everyone not to be racist, and, and, it, and it worked, just no one was racist anymore. After that, we, we, we cured racism by telling people not to be racist. Oh, wait, like half the people who endorsed this book at the beginning actually think that shit. Bullying against trans kids is way overblown, and the steps we've taken to stop it have just created more victims. Like Christian kids who wouldn't feel comfortable using their faith as an excuse to bully people. Oh, wait, sorry, that's, uh, that's the old uh, SJW talking. That's what we do. We invent new bullies out of people just voicing their opinions. You can't bully someone with words, after all. They're, they're harmless. But, but don't forget that free speech is vitally important because words have power and need to be protected. No, us woke types just invent bullies who then become the real victim. Can you guess the biggest victims of the woke bully making to Schreier? I'll give you a hint. They were in that story about the parents who ripped their kid away from their home and all their friends and threw away their binder to get them away from all those dangerous words. Yep, you guessed it. You know what Shriers are all about by now. It's the parents. It's good old mom and dad. This chapter starts as it is meant to continue. Catherine is often accused of being a transphobe, but really she was too accepting and should have opposed her kid's transition from the start. Once again, we know she's not a bigot because she supported gay marriage. And it's a broken record at this point, but I cannot believe someone who wrote this book in a room with air in it will take so much time to explain the differences between being gay and being trans, but use one support of the former to shield bigotry against the latter. And also, once again, this parent took to the internet for solutions to her child's wishes and... No joke was disappointed to find that nothing supported her own ideas. And at no point did she take that as a sign that she might be wrong. Not just the internet, but the schools and therapists were against her too, enraging Catherine and getting her to conclude that she should have never trusted anyone beyond her own parental instincts. So she searched and searched in order to find affirmation of her own belief and you wouldn't believe that she eventually found Transgender Trend and Fourth Wave Now, the sites used for that litmus study, and presented without irony in a book claiming that the internet is a contagion for bad ideas to spread. Schreier even writes, With the help of sites like Fourth Wave Now, Catherine began to realize that her daughter had become caught in a cultural current, and she wasn't alone. No irony whatsoever. Schreier speaks to the public face of Fourth Wave Now, a woman who took drastic measures to, and this is a direct quote from the book, undermine her kid's trans identity by being another parent who ripped their kid away from their friends in school to move across the country to force them to start life again as a girl. This is once again framed as a success story because you have to get your daughter out of that cult by any means necessary, but, but it's okay when parents do it. Catherine, who searched and searched to have her own beliefs affirmed rather than take a single nanosecond to consider that she might be wrong, eventually founded the Kelsey Coalition to oppose transgender ideology. 
But, you know, you, you can't call her a transphobe. That's bullying. Then immediately after the chapter decrying how horrible it is for schools to follow legal precedent by not revealing sensitive medical information to parents, Trier writes about the struggle of Catherine, who must remain anonymous so that her trans child doesn't find out that their mother runs an organization devoted to opposing their existence. Progressivism is consistently framed as one of the root causes of this problem by Schreier, who somehow got the endorsements of Dennis Prager and Ben Shapiro for this book. Open-mindedness has robbed kids of the rebellion they so badly want, you see. And maybe if parents had faked horror or moral outrage while unleashing a tirade of abuse at their children, things might not be as bad as they are now. Gaslight your children! It's the only way to save them! I thought we just had to be nice to Abigail, what the fuck? Oh, and even though lesbians are okay, lots of girls just pretend to love their girlfriends because, you know, boys are immature. Remember, homosexuality was just the spearhead of this whole corrupting arrow to Schreier. She and people like her don't partition their bigotry to neatly separate trans people from the rest of the LGBTQ umbrella. Next is Richard, which offers a chance for Schreier to defend Republicans who don't really care about gay rights or abortion. They just want small governments. And like many of the upstanding parents Schreier talks to, they hold financial support hostage so that their children do not pursue identities that the parents find gross. However, Richard is a real man. But when he talks about his kid, he frames it in terms of losing battles when his child gets treatment, looking ready to break walls in his anger. Schreier frames him as the victim when he threatened to cut off his relationship with his kid, who then called his bluff. This kid was in college, a legal adult, but children are the property of their parents in Trier's world, so when they don't turn out like what you wanted, it's a betrayal. There's a quote from a parent in this chapter that could be verbatim what one of the influencers, Jet, was responding to earlier when Schreier lied about what he was saying. My belief has always been, if I loved her enough, she wouldn't do this. Love is a weapon to shape your property as you see fit. At least according to Schreier. The chapter ends with a preemptive segue into the next one, about how therapists are bad because they allow their kids to think about themselves, instead of having their feelings and concerns dismissed by the proper parenting of previous generations. Here's how chapter 6, The Shrinks, starts. A woman walks into the therapist's office, dragging your teenage son. Doctor, she says, please help, my son thinks he's a chicken. The son says, if there's one thing I can tell you about chickens, it's that we know who we are. Where's your proof, the woman demands of her son. You have no feathers. True, the son replies. I went through the wrong puberty. The woman turns to the therapist. You see what I mean? He's lost his mind. The therapist replies, you're the one arguing with the chicken. The only thing this book has contributed to the world, aside from baseless fear-mongering, is a slightly better version of the attack helicopter joke. And she takes it seriously. This is how she wants you to view the affirmative care model of treatment. You see, even Schreier has to admit that the overwhelming preponderance of evidence is against her, so she must twist this in her favor somehow. When the American Medical Association, the American College of Physicians, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Psychological Association, and the Pediatric Endocrine Society all endorse the same model, well, there's nowhere to go but the conspiracy route. This is the chapter where Schreier makes her opinions known that trans people are not and never will be who they say they are. She reluctantly admits that transitioning can indeed help some people with gender dysphoria, but it's in service of a falsehood. This is proof that <gasps> doctors listen to their patients, in addition to the mountains of evidence showing that gender-affirming care is effective. She compares this to calling anorexics fat because that's how they see themselves. Because of course she does. I mean, anorexics want to be fat, and their suffering stems from society not seeing them as overweight. Which makes this comparison very smart, and definitely demonstrates the deep understanding of mental health issues one should have before writing a book like this. The APA has caved to political correctness over biology, because Schreier learned about biology in second grade and there can't be any more to it than that. Wait, who put these sources on the biological basis of gender identity on screen? Shoot, shoot, get out of here! We're talking about Abigail Schreier here, and studies frighten and confuse her. When confronted with a therapist actually familiar with the research saying that adolescents supported by their parents have much better mental health outcomes than the parents Schreier is valorizing in her book, she takes it as yet further proof that we're just bullying parents. How horrible that parents don't feel like they can completely and utterly dismiss their children because it might result in bad things. This is, I can't slap my secretary's ass in the office anymore. Feminism has ruined the workplace. Levels of oppression-seeking. 
hey, remember the theme we've established about how Schreier and Littman both want to shield the parents in these texts from accusations of bigotry by letting you know that they support gay people, and that's just idiotic on the face of it? Well, here's a paragraph that explicitly spells out why even Schreier knows what she's doing is disingenuous. An adolescent who comes out as gay asks her parents to accept her for what she is. An adolescent who is transgender identified asks to be accepted for what she is not. Undoing your own arguments and cementing your status as an unambiguous transphobic bigot. A true feat of prose from Schreier. A trained therapist says, Hey, if your kid wants to be called by a different name and pronouns, it's really easy to do and, and shows the love and support they need regardless of what they might do in the future. Schreier, horrified. Why? Haven't these poor parents already been through enough? It's great, though, that this makes the second trained researcher, the other one being Lisa Littman, someone on her side, who silently clutches their temples when dealing with the hysterical incompetence Schreier shows when confronted with even the most basic degree of research interpretation. This is why she identifies so much with these parents. In response to a pretty basic and straightforward outline of our current understanding of the interactions between DNA and identity, about how our societal construction of labels often falls short of someone's internal experiences, and that fluid identities are no more false than consistent ones, Try responds earnestly, Well, what if it's hard? What if your religion disagrees with the science? This is the second fucking time she's pointed to religious bigots as being the real victims. Holy shit. This makes the next section, where Schreier flails and fumbles trying to comprehend the science that goes against her position, the funniest part of the book to anyone actually familiar with the research. Here's an example. What studies do show is that nearly all adolescents who identify as transgender and are put on puberty blockers go on to take cross-sex hormones. If this is ringing a bell to you, yes, the source she uses is the same one John Doyle used to say the exact same thing, and it's just as wrong now as when that tiny Tucker Carlson impersonator used it. Actually, I take that back, because in addition to lying about the purpose of the study, she lies about the results. The study was conducted to measure the effectiveness of puberty suppression in treating adolescents with gender dysphoria, and it found that it significantly improved behavioral and emotional functions in these kids. So you'd think that these positive outcomes following puberty suppression and pretty straightforward decision to take cross-sex hormones afterwards shows that, yes, some kids do know what they are at a young age, and trained therapists are invaluable for helping them. But this is Schreier, and Schreier's a liar. Nope, what this actually shows is that teenagers love to test boundaries by lying for the lulls, and we failed them by not recognizing it. The prefrontal cortex, she writes, uh, believed to hold the seat of self-regulation, typically does not complete development until age 25. Her source for that is a 2009 study published in the Journal of Adolescent Health that says, As of yet, neuroimaging studies do not allow a chronologic cut point for behavioral or cognitive maturity at either the individual or population level. So, once again, nearly exactly opposite to what she says it says. It's okay, though. Here's a fucking two-page long anecdote about how she thought her boobs were too big, but her dad put her in her place by telling her that's how women should look. This, like anorexics wanting to be called fat, is the same thing as providing evidence. Incredible. I love this until I think about how it might have irrevocably poisoned the discourse around trans kids for the foreseeable future. Hey look, it's Lisa Marciano, one of the consultants for the Littman study who thinks Ray Blanchard was totally right when he said that trans women were just male perverts aroused by the thought of wearing a dress, getting interviewed for her opinion on social transitioning. And this leads Schreier to, of course, compare it to the Holocaust. I'm going to put these pages on screen so that you can pause and read if you want to, to see if I'm misrepresenting Schreier here. Three, two, one. Like, half the people who wrote praise for her book in the beginning are on record, chastising the left for saying that everyone they don't like is a Nazi, and here she is comparing trans kids to a Holocaust survivor who expunged her Jewish identity to escape persecution. She is so thoroughly committed to her propaganda that she'll use a period in time where progressive research on LGBT issues was burned in a fascistic purge to support her thesis that progressive research on LGBT issues is a danger to our children. She uses Dr. Kenneth Zucker, an old-school gender psychologist, who advises setting limits on gender-inappropriate behaviors as a treatment for gender dysphoria, to really hammer home the point she was trying to make with that Holocaust comparison, that social transition is not nothing. And for once, she's right, it is indeed not nothing. That's why the nice therapist lady you talked to uh, told you about all the research showing that a supportive environment is crucial for the well-being of trans people. Trier? Societal pressures do indeed play a large part in the suppression of identities. Trier? Being called one thing for a long time and then working up the courage to announce to your peers that you'd like to be called something else can be really tough. 
Trier, I want you to listen to this paragraph and tell me if you could easily see this in a completely different book about supporting trans kids. We are by nature social animals, as Aristotle once observed. We absorb ideas about ourselves from our surroundings more often than we realize, and more deeply than we know. If we attend a school or live in a family in which we are made to feel stupid or told we are, some number of us will come to believe it. If a boy is placed in a school in which other boys tease him for being gay, he may come to internalize their homophobia. He may turn his anger inward at himself. This came at the end of the Holocaust comparison, where she's trying to argue that it's dangerous to let trans kids express themselves. Hey look, another anecdote from a fictional collection of short stories to suggest that trans kids threatening suicide is just a manipulative teenage defiance tactic. And as fucking gross as that is, it does lead me to my favorite paragraph in the book. To critique the infamous Williams Institute study, the one where the 41% suicide attempt statistic comes from, Trier says this, There are a few problems with the study, however. One is that it is entirely based on self-report. More rigorous studies always follow up with in-person interviews. Yes, Schreier, that's typically how surveys work. However, we call that a limitation rather than a fault, as surveys are generally the only option you have when you want to gather data on behaviors of large groups of people. Most departments just don't have the resources or subject recruitment capabilities to do in-person interviews with 6,500 people. There's always the possibility that you don't get a representative sample of your population or that participants will misunderstand a question that the researcher isn't in the room to explain. And so any survey on its own is not enough to make a grand sweeping statement about any group or phenomenon. The Lisa Littman study that Schreier is basing her grand sweeping statements on is an online survey. Not only that, the rebuttal she uses to say that this survey is flawed because it's based on self-report is from an anonymous writer at Fourth Wave Now, one of the anti-trans affirming websites Littman recruited her second-hand parental reports of behavior from. I mean, if you want an expert opinion on shitty surveys, that's a great place to get it, but not for nothing, but the article from Fourth Wave Now she links contains the sentence, and later, buried in the executive summary, we find this. Which, like, the executive summary is, like, literally the first page of the paper that you read if you, if you don't want to read the rest of the report. It, like, sums up the report. It's, you don't, you don't hide things there. You don't hide something you want to go by unnoticed in the, like, literal summary at the top of the report. It's just not how you do things. Uh, and the paragraph that they show is from the discussion section of that report, not the executive summary. So, thoroughly researched, they said. Trier is trying her hardest to create a scenario in which there is simply no world in which she is wrong, even in this world where all the evidence is against her. She correctly points out that trans kids can have mental health issues outside of gender dysphoria because they live in the same world with the same problems as everyone else outside of their gender. Here, that's being used to show that transitioning may not be the end-all be-all answer to a trans kid's problems, which would be good. If not for her earlier chapters in which a trans kid still having mental health issues after transitioning was proof that it didn't work. And because I am cursed to debunk the same sources from transphobes over and over again until the day the amulet is returned to me, she brings up the Sweden study in the same way every idiot before her has done. Go watch my second video ever to see why no one who is using this study in this way knows how to read studies. Including Schreier, who, in addition to saying that there is no evidence that affirming trans people, which, yes there is, here's an incomplete list of meta-analyses saying so, also only wants to bring up the one study she feels is easiest to pick apart. That study is Olson et al.'s 2015 study titled Mental Health of Transgender Children Who Are Supported in Their Identities, which found that, quote, socially transitioned transgender children who are supported in their gender identity have developmentally normative levels of depression and only minimal elevations in anxiety, suggesting that psychopathology is not inevitable within this group. Like any study, it's not perfect and it has its limitations, which is why I wouldn't rely on it alone to support the position that affirmation is good for trans kids. Let's hear what Schreier has to say about these data in her footnote. Note also that this study was based on the report of parents who had supported socially transitioning their children. While it is very common practice to rely on parental reports for mental health assessments of children, in this case, the parents were arguably biased. Having supported the social transition of their children to everyone they knew, one would think that they would be highly motivated to report that they had made the right decision. What parents could live with themselves suspecting they had made the wrong call? 
You'll base an entire fucking book on a survey that recruited from sites dedicated to opposing affirmative treatment. You'll not only take the word of bigoted parents who abuse and gaslight their children, but paint them as the true victims. You'll use a single fucking survey as the basis for comparing trans identities to the goddamn Holocaust and straight up lie about creators to paint them as child predators for having the audacity to speak about their own experiences. But you'll suddenly learn just enough about research methodology to show that this one study is not proof that we should support trans kids. I'm done. This is not a book review channel, and it never will be. The remaining chapters are just classic conservative oppression-seeking behavior, including the most pick-me-I'm-the-good-trans interview with Buck Angel I've ever seen, which makes this tweet defending the book particularly unfortunate. God, just read this section and the way he just sits there and takes it. You know what this reminds me of? Now we're equal. You call me whatever you want. You know what I mean? Like, you, yeah. you could call me well, and that's what it right feels now. like it to wouldn't me. mean anything to me. The, the so that's all I have to say about this book. If this wasn't enough to convince you that the sole motivation Schreier had for writing this garbage was to fearmonger through lies and misrepresentations of both research and real people, I don't think anything in the later chapters will. If you want another long and incredibly well-researched takedown of this book, please go check out and support Samantha from the channel Princess Jellyfish, who made an incredible video on the topic and was kind enough to voice those lines on incredibly short notice. The book is poorly researched, intentionally cruel, and dishonest at every level from presentation to promotion. If you disagree and want to defend this book, send me an email at the address listed below in the description, where you can also find a document containing all the studies I've referenced in this video and more. We'll set up a debate. I too love free speech, Schreier, and it would be a shame to waste that free speech only on echo chambers, wouldn't it? Thank you everyone for watching. This one was a little bit different, a little more free-flowing, a little less heavy on just straight-up research, but I still had it. Well, fun's not the right word for it, but I did enjoy the process of making this video and I hope that it has done a little bit of good so uh, if you'd like to you can follow me on Twitter at SJW debates and like I said if you want to send me an email with any requests for of the debate variety or not you can reach me at SJW debates at gmail.com and if you're super cool you can support me on my patreon which is at this link below as well as linked in the description so I want to thank my patrons bearded Cuban Benick G. Spicer, Brian Lemer, Casey Explosion, Deborah Goldsmith, Edward Normal, Gavin Pittard, Jake McCann, Leonard Mattiason, Oliver, Only Slightly, Sam, Spoop, Wait I'm Curious, and Zach Viper. Thank you all so much for helping me make these videos.